Good afternoon and thank all of you for being here. You know, we typically tell you when we think the next press conference is going to be, and then we say, but if we have reason to call you in early, we will. Well, this is, this is one of those times. As usual, uh, I'll be joined today by Dr. Canner, and he'll be speaking to you in just a few moments. Before we get to uh, COVID, which is the reason uh, for the press conference, I did want to start off with some good news that we received today from the White House. President Biden has approved my request for a major disaster federal declaration for the winter storms uh, that occurred last month. Um, you will remember that the first system of heavy rains and wintry precipitation, freezing temperatures began moving across Louisiana on February the 11th, and a second similar system followed on the 17th. Uh, we saw some of the lowest temperatures ever recorded, along with major power outages and disruption to water systems uh, across the state. Today we learned that individual assistance uh, has been provided for the following parishes, Avoyles, Bienville, Bossier, Caddo, Calcasieu, Catahoula, Claiborne, Concordia, DeSoto, East Baton Rouge, Franklin, Brant, LaSalle, Madison, Natchitoches, Washita, Rapides, Red River, Richland, Sabine, Webster, West Carroll, and Wynn. That's a lot, uh, and uh, we still have eight parishes that uh, we requested assistance for. Those requests are still pending. Um, I will tell you that they include Caldwell, East Carroll, Jackson, Lincoln, Morehouse, Tensaw, Union, and Vernon. Further, Category B, public assistance, uh, has been authorized for all 64 parishes along with assistance under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. We're very grateful for the Biden administration for granting this request and the additional help will be instrumental as we continue to recover from the winter storm, but also the mitigation could be very helpful to us in terms of winterizing uh, some of our water systems, for example, uh, depending on the level of assistance uh, that we actually get uh, from that. But that's something we're gonna be looking forward to uh, implementing just as soon as we possibly can. So back to COVID, um, you all are probably aware that it was exactly one year ago today that Louisiana confirmed its first case of COVID-19 uh, through a positive test result. Since then, there have been more than 430,000 cases in Louisiana. Uh, and more than 6.1 million tests have been administered. And you can remember how hard it was to get the testing program up and running. We just didn't have the test available to us. Uh, but a year later, uh, we've tested, again, more than 6.1 million uh, people. And, and, of course, we're getting close to 10,000 people in Louisiana have died uh, from COVID-19. This has obviously been a year of grave loss and heartbreak. Um, but we have come a long way uh, since that first case a year ago. Uh, most importantly, at least for me, is that we now have three safe and effective vaccines that are going to help us and the rest of the country, indeed the rest of the world, put an end to the pandemic. And for that, we can be very thankful. Uh, indeed, there's light at the end of the tunnel. The number of Louisianans who've completed their vaccine series now exceeds the number of Louisianans who've been diagnosed with COVID-19. That's another good milestone that we're looking uh, forward to, to having many more uh, of those types of milestones, but, but that's something that I wanted to highlight for you all today. And today we're announcing an even greater expansion of vaccine eligibility. Probably the worst kept secret in the history of secrets. Uh, actually, it, it wasn't a secret at all. And, and uh, when you have uh, as many providers uh, as we have in the program, uh, 
who are eligible and, and approved by the CDC to receive uh, and administer the vaccine, anytime you're, you're making changes, you have to be communicating that uh, up and down uh, the line. Um, and so we started communicating yesterday because we want these new priority um, individuals to be able to get vaccine just as quickly as possible. Effective immediately, all Louisianans 16 and older with certain health conditions that make them more likely to suffer a serious complication from COVID-19. So those who are more vulnerable uh, to the disease will be eligible to receive the vaccine. The conditions listed by the CDC that place an individual in a higher risk, um, and there are a number of them, and they're more than the parishes that I just listed. But I am gonna go through them uh, one time, and of course this is all available online. Um, and I'll, I'll give you that link uh, in just a moment as well. But these comorbid health conditions that make people more vulnerable to the disease are asthma, cancer, cerebrovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, and cardiomyopathies. Hypertension, immunocompromised state, that's a weakened immune system uh, from solid organ transplant, immunocompromised state from blood or bone marrow transplant, immune deficiencies, HIV, use of corticosteroids, or use of other immune weakening medicines. Other conditions include obesity, severe obesity, overweight, pregnancy, pulmonary fibrosis, severe neurologic conditions such as dementia, sickle cell disease, smoking, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and a blood disorder. Thalassemia? Say it again. What he said. Um, please note that uh, as of right now, only the Pfizer vaccine is authorized for individuals 16 and 17 years old. And so if you're 16 or 17 and you qualify because of one or more of these conditions, uh, that's the only vaccine that you're going to be able to take. The Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson are approved at 18 and older. For a list of these conditions and a list of locations where you can schedule an appointment to get the vaccine, as well as the contact information that you need in order to schedule that appointment, please visit covidvaccine.la.gov. You will need to complete a form uh, for your vaccine provider that will be available uh, at the location. Uh, that certifies that you have one or more of these health conditions. Um, obviously, it is extremely important that people be honest and that only the people uh, who have these conditions or in this age range actually avail themselves of the vaccine. Otherwise, they will be uh, depriving someone who is at greater risk uh, to having a severe complication or severe case of COVID-19 from having access to the vaccine. Uh, as soon as it would be available to them otherwise. So asking people to, to be honest, obviously, as we have been throughout. We came to this decision after hearing from our providers over the weekend um, that there's a little slack in the appointments uh, and that they were able to accommodate and ready to accommodate more people. We also uh, have had a very stable supply, especially of the Moderna and the Pfizer. Uh, so we feel comfortable about what's coming ahead. And then Operation Warp Speed has told us, um, and I'll be speaking with them again um, in just a short while, that, uh, that those uh, amounts are going to be steady going forward. And then eventually, uh, probably towards the very end of the month, we will get uh, an additional allocation of Johnson & Johnson as well. Uh, that should be steady from that point on out. 
so the availability of the vaccine is, is such that it's the the right thing to do and the time to do it. Um, I do want to remind people that appointments are always required uh, for a COVID uh, vaccine. And it, but it's not just that the uh, supply of vaccine has become stable and, and, and actually increased uh, over time. It's also the fact that uh, when you look at our gating criteria baseline numbers, whether it's percent positivity, cases, hospitalizations, and unfortunately deaths, uh, they've all become stable. So, so we're no longer getting better, uh, not getting worse, uh, with the possible exception of Region 5, and we announced that to you all uh, when we uh, made the change to the current restrictions and, and um, mitigation measures in the proclamation. So, so we, we've stopped improving, um, and, and in every previous instance when that has happened, there was another surge. We don't want there to be another surge, and we certainly don't want any increased cases uh, to be among those people who are more vulnerable. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that, that we're doing this right now as well. And then the, the last part of this is we know that here in Louisiana and across the country, a larger percentage of cases are being driven by the variant strains of the coronavirus, uh, particularly the one uh, from UK, the B117. Um, and we know that it is more easily transmitted, and that by itself means it's more deadly because uh, there's a certain percentage of people who get COVID that, that are going to die. And the more people get it, the more going to die. But it's in addition to being more transmissible, it is also more virulent. Uh, and, and so we are literally in a race against uh, uh, transmission of the virus, especially the new variants. And so that's one of the reasons that we wanted to, to expand these uh, eligibility uh, for the vaccine at this time. So it is good news that we're able to do it, um, and we didn't want to wait. We would normally wait and, and, and do this after the weekly uh, press conference as it is regularly scheduled, uh, but our goal is to not have any vaccine sitting on a shelf any longer than is absolutely necessary. Uh, and so these, this new priority that I'm talking about is, is effective immediately. That's another reason we had to communicate with all these providers uh, yesterday. With the increasing um, uh, presence of, of the more contagious, more virulent um, strains of, of the virus, it also underscores what we told you all from the very beginning. Our primary goal in establishing priorities for vaccination would be to preserve hospital capacity and to save lives. And that is why we are working with individuals with the comorbid health conditions that predispose them to a poor outcome should they contract the virus. Uh, this is fully consistent with what we've been telling you uh, all along. Um, and there are certain uh, groups that are listed uh, in, in the approach that we're going to be taking eventually that, that really go by industry group or occupation uh, and so forth. Um, and, and I do expect that, that we will get to those at some point. In the meantime, there will be people all across Louisiana in every industry grouping, every type of occupation who are going to be eligible for the vaccine. And so it'll be eligible for those who most need it, regardless of where they work or whether they work. So if you have one of these underlying conditions and you are 16 and older, you are eligible, period. That's where we are today. Um, and everyone who is in the prior eligibility groups remain eligible. So teachers, healthcare folks, and all, all of that. And you just, remember, tell you, it's not like a light switch where we're going to flip certain people on and, and then off. Once you're on, you continue to be on for the duration of the program. We're also expanding eligibility for any staff working in congregate facilities such as prisons or jail staff, shelter staff, group home staff, uh, because of the especially high level of exposure they have. Um, and, and you don't want individuals uh, bringing the virus uh, into a congregant setting if, if uh, you can do anything uh, to prevent that from happening. 
Today, with respect to our COVID numbers, we are reporting 631 cases on 18,017 tests. That brings us to a total of 434,926 cases to date. We're also very sadly reporting 11 new deaths. So the total deaths now, I told you earlier, it's approaching 10,000, it's 9,769. Currently, there are 543 individuals hospitalized across the state with COVID-19. That is plus nine. And while it's only one day, and it's a smaller number than we've seen before, that's the largest daily increase in quite some time. We hope that does not begin a trend. Uh, ventilated patients are flat at 75. As you know, yesterday the CDC put out new guidance on activities that fully vaccinated people can safely uh, resume. Uh, I know that's going to be welcome news for a lot of people. It also can be confusing, and and I think it's a function of human nature that sometimes people hear what they want to hear uh, in the, this guidance. And so we're going to ask Dr. Cantor in just a minute to come up and kind of walk through that and what it means in layman's terms. But what we know is the more people who get vaccinated and the faster this happens, uh, the more life will return to normal. And we're certainly not back at normal yet, but this is some really good news uh, as we start moving in that direction. And in fact, I think I'm going to ask Dr. Cantor to come up now and go through that and some other information with you. And if you don't mind, while he's at the podium, if you've got questions for him, go ahead and ask him. And then I'll be back uh, on uh, the other side of his presentation. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your leadership throughout um, this past 12 months. It, it, is, it is remarkable to think um, what we've been through in the past 12 months of what we've endured and um, to look forward to of, of what's what's coming ahead. I want to take a moment and um, you know, as the governor did acknowledge the 9,769 Louisianans who lost their life from COVID, uh, their family members who, who um, suffered incredible loss, um, everyone who has sacrificed tremendously during the past 12 months and you know, particularly the healthcare workers who have uh, really been there the whole time um, trying, trying to care for other people. So um, if folks haven't had a chance to um, take a look at the, the, the flag memorial on the front lawn of the Capitol building, it is quite striking um, when you see you know, almost 10,000 flags out there and, and think about what each of those families had to go through. So it's important you know, 12 months into the day, I think, to, um, to recognize that. I also think it's important to recognize that we have better days ahead. There's no question about that. Um, with the vaccine rollout going well, with three very efficacious, very safe vaccines, and now with new guidance uh, giving us some, some more latitude of what we can do with our families and, and friends once we do get vaccinated. All of that is, is really encouraging, and I anticipate these type of welcomed advances to continue in the weeks and a couple months ahead. So um, with that, I'll talk a little bit about what the CDC announced yesterday. This is very welcome news to all of us. We had been um, hearing from, from Dr. Fauci for a couple of weeks now that he uh, felt it was about time that, that, that uh, he kept referring to, to grandparents being able to hug their grandkids. And, uh, and I know he's very happy about this news. He shared that with us the other day um, on a phone call. So uh, the CDC announced three, um, three things that people who are, are vaccinated fully vaccinated um, can now do. So I'll walk through those things. It's important to say what fully vaccinated means. Fully vaccinated means you are 14 or more days out from completing your vaccine series. So if that's Pfizer or Moderna, it's 14 days out from that second dose. If it's Johnson & Johnson, it's 14 days out from your one and done dose. Um, you're not fully vaccinated uh, until you've completed those 14 days after getting that, that last or that single dose. Once you are fully vaccinated, um, number one, um, if you are gathering in a small group with other people 
who are fully vaccinated. You do not need to mask, you don't need to distance. So uh, an example of if a grandparent comes over and grandparents vac fully vaccinated and um, the family they're visiting are, are fully vaccinated, then they don't need to mask and distance um, as long as no one in that group is showing any symptoms. Uh, the second thing is um, if someone who is fully vaccinated is visiting with one family unit who is not fully vaccinated and no one in that unit is showing any symptoms and no one in that unit is high risk for complications of COVID, meaning no one in that unit has one of the 23 conditions that the governor just enumerated, then they do not need to mask and distance. That's, that's, that's really important and that, that gives a lot of latitude to people who want to get together with family um, and the grandparents might, or the parents might be vaccinated and they haven't seen a family in a, in a long time. If it's one family unit, that's allowed. If it's multiple family units that have not been vaccinated, then everyone needs to mask and distance. If it's multiple family units that haven't been vaccinated, everyone continues to mask and distance. But if it's one family unit that hasn't been vaccinated and no one is showing any symptoms and no one is high risk, then, um, then folks do not need to mask and distance in those circumstances. And then the third thing result, uh, relates to quarantine. Um, previously, up until yesterday, the CDC advised that people who are fully vaccinated, should they come in close contact after becoming fully vaccinated with someone who's positive for COVID, have 90 days, at which point they don't need to quarantine. And after 90 days, I would have to go quarantine again. They've lifted that, that 90 day recommendation. So now once you're fully vaccinated, 14 days out from that last or single dose, if you come in, if you're a close contact with a known case, you do not need to quarantine. This is the result of really two things. Number one, there is now a growing body of evidence, not conclusive, but a growing body of evidence, a lot of data from the UK, a lot of data from Israel, showing that vaccine not only prevents that individual from getting sick or dying, but it prevents also or reduces the chance of asymptomatic infection and the chance for transmission to others. A growing body of evidence showing that. Something that we, we presumed and certainly hoped, but we're waiting for the data to come in. And secondly, just looking across the country, cases in general have gone down substantially from where they were over New Year's, which means the risk out in the community, while still not low, I think, is much lower than it was a couple months ago. The CDC also is cognizant that, you know, it's important for people to get some semblance of normalcy back. And it's important at this point in time to be very clear about what the gift of vaccine affords us and that all of those factors inform these recommendations. So let me just review quickly um, what you can do now if you're fully vaccinated 14 days out and what we would still ask you to continue to do. You can visit indoors with other fully vaccinated people without masking and distancing. You can visit indoors with unvaccinated people from a single household who are all low risk for severe COVID disease by the virtue of any underlying conditions they might have um, without masking and distancing, assuming no one has any symptoms at that point in time. And you can refrain from quarantining following uh, known exposure to a case of COVID. We would still ask you, after being fully vaccinated, to continue to do the following. Continue to take precautions when you're out in public, like wearing a mask and distancing and washing your hands. Uh, continue to wear a mask, distance, and adhere to other preventative measures when you are visiting other unvaccinated people who are at increased risk of complications. Continue to wear masks and distance when you visit with unvaccinated members from multiple households. Continue to avoid medium and large size gatherings if distancing will not be allowed or um, able to be accomplished in that setting. Continue to get tested for COVID if you do show COVID-like symptoms. Continue to follow whatever guidance your, your employer issues for that workplace setting and continue to pay attention to any travel recommendations put out by the CDC. 
I will say these guidelines are general guidelines. The, the guidelines of this nature are never going to be absolute. So if a particular family has particular concerns about an individual or specific health concerns for anyone involved or, or just concerned in general, it's never, never wrong to be more conservative, never wrong to be more safe, never wrong to mask and distance if you want to be extra careful. But again, I think this will allow families who are vaccinated to get a little sense of, of normalcy back. And it's, it is, it is nice to have these announced, you know, um, so close, um, you know, one day shy of our 12 month anniversary, which is what the CDC did. I wanted to also give an update. Uh, we've added some new visibility to the uh, COVID vaccine dashboard that will now allow people to uh, get more granular information, not just on a state level, but by region and by parish as well. So by region and parish now, you can go on to the COVID dashboard on LDH's site and see a total number of people vaccinated, both initial, initiated the series and completed the series. And you'll be able to see uh, racial demographics for both of those two measures. You know, what we're gonna be looking at with increasing frequency going forward is honing in on particular areas in Louisiana and trying to see where we need to do more work to get the vaccine out. We're gonna be able to see which parishes or which localities are, have a larger coverage of people vaccinated, which have a smaller coverage, and that's going to inform where we put resources. Because at the end of the day, we want to bring all of Louisiana up to vaccination, and we're going to be looking at data to help guide where we put our resources. As a state level, 17.3% of the state's population has now initiated the vaccine series, and 9.9% have completed that series. And every day that number grows, and that is Truly, truly exciting. I'll give you a little bit of um, an update of, of what we anticipate with vaccine deliveries in the coming week um, with the caveat that, as the governor mentioned, our, our call with the White House typically is um, Tuesday morning, get pushed back to Tuesday afternoon today, so it hasn't happened yet. And, and typically we'll get um, notified later in the afternoon on Tuesdays what amount of vaccine to um, to expect the following week, and then that number gets confirmed on Thursdays. As it stands now, we are expecting um, flat shipments from this current week. So that would be 57,330 doses of Pfizer, 45,000 doses of Moderna, and unfortunately, no additional doses of J&J. &J. That is what we received this, this prior week. It, it's certainly possible, and I think we're hopeful that those two numbers will go up a little bit after we have our, our check-in with the White House later today. But that's, that's what we can, um, that's a conservative es estimate of what we can expect next week, which is totals to 102,330 doses. Um, I wanna thank everyone that helped uh, put on the large scale and smaller scale events uh, for vaccine, particularly the Johnson & Johnson events that happened over the past week and a half. Um, for what I saw personally, um, and from what I heard um, from colleagues and other individuals that um, availed themselves of those events, they went very, very well. A lot of work goes into these, and it's a good partnership between the state, the Department of Health, local governments, community-based organizations, vaccine providers like clinics, pharmacies, and hospitals. And I think the experience was, was really, really good. It is very clear, as it has been for quite some time now, that the capacity of Louisiana to administer vaccine far exceeds the supply, far exceeds the supply. And we are in very good position for when supply does pick up to be able to move that vaccine connected to individuals quickly and equitably, which is and remains to be the goal. I do want to mention what um, some updated numbers on the variants, which um, continue to give me great concern. Um, for the B117 variant, which is the variant identified in the UK, we're now up to 20 confirmed cases in Louisiana and an additional 74 suspect cases that are pending confirmation at the CDC. Most, if not all of those, are going to end up being positive. What's happening now is there are so many more variants, uh, particularly the B117 in the US, that the CDC is just having a tough time um, doing all that sequencing quickly. So there's a little bit of a backlog by then. Um, there's been some data out nationally to suggest that um, about 20 to 25% now of, of cases sampled in, in the US are uh, 
positive for the B117 variant. That's not a definitive number because we don't do a lot of genomic sequencing. It's an estimate based on a couple labs sampling. But it's a marker of how much this variant has spread. I can tell you it's in 49 states right now, probably in 50, but at least definitively identified in 49 states and a total of 3,037 cases um, across the country. Surely many, many more, just that's what's been identified. And again, our strategy here is to do two things to buy us time, to continue to reduce transmission as much as we can and to work as hard as we can to get vaccine out as quickly and equitably as we can so that when these variants increase even more, we have we're starting from a lower place and we have more vaccine coverage out there. For the B1351 variant, that's the variant identified in South Africa. We have not yet identified a case in Louisiana. It has been identified so far in 20 states, uh, the closest to us being Texas, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, North and South Carolina. For the P1 variant or the Brazilian variant, we also have not identified it yet in Louisiana. It has been identified in nine states, the closest of, to us being Oklahoma and Florida. We will um, certainly let you know if and when that all that changes. Some encouraging news with the variant is um, additional data has come out, this time um, from a report in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing confidence that the vaccines are efficacious against the variants, against all three variants, really. Uh, particularly efficacious against the, the, the B117 or the UK variant. This was an in vitro study, so it's not as good as a real life world study, which are tough to do in real time. But it adds to the body of evidence now that these vaccines are going to provide good protection against the variant. That's all the more reason that we have to work as hard as we can to get vaccine out as quickly and equitably as possible. That's why I'm excited that we're expanding eligibility. And I would really encourage people, if you have just become eligible, don't pass up that opportunity. Don't pass up the opportunity to get vaccinated. This is, this is a life-saving intervention. Nothing short of that. These, these vaccines are, are life-saving interventions. If you have just become eligible, do not pass up the opportunity. Go and get vaccinated. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yes, sir. That, that doses would have gone unused had the state not expanded eligibility today. Do we have any idea how many might have gone unused? And does that imply also a, a, an unwillingness to get the vaccine or give you any cause for concern uh, that people are not taking the vaccine as, as much as we hope they would? Uh, I, I think they all would have been used. I think, um, you know, what we've, what we've tried to do every time that we have expanded eligibility is you know, we maintain conversations with our vaccine providers, like the governor said, and, and we try and find that sweet spot of when there's a little bit of daylight in the scheduling. And that's a message to us, you know, to expand. Um, we never want to wait too much. We never want to make um, supply and demand be exactly even because you want to have a little bit of drive. Uh, the CDC had recommended initially they threw the number 80% out as a ballpark of daylight. We actually haven't waited that much at all because we want vaccine to be out there quickly. So I don't think the doses would have been wasted. I do think they'll be used quicker now. Um, you know, I think this was, this was the right time to expand. Yeah, yeah Melinda. process has started for about half the people who were previously eligible. So um, I could infer that that means that half the people who are, were already eligible before this announcement had shown no interest so far in, in getting vaccinated. So, so does that concern you about reaching the number needed for herd immunity if, if you didn't see enough uptick in the last set of people who were eligible? I don't think so. I was, I was impressed with the uptick that we saw. And it's, it's really challenging to take a number and, and, and decide what percentage of people got vaccinated because the numbers that we've projected as, as the, you know, the, the totals for the eligibility tiers, they're really gross estimates. And, you know, for example, I really don't know how many teachers were also eligible through a health condition, for example, um, or pregnant or, or anything else that would make them eligible. So it becomes very challenging to say X number of people were eligible and X number of people got it because we really don't have a precise number for the eligibility we try and try and project. You know, I think vaccine confidence only grows day by day. That's what the national data has shown. And anecdotally, talking to individuals, talking to healthcare providers who may be waited a week or two early on are now getting vaccinated. I think the more people 
see their friends and family get vaccinated, um, the more that they hear about it, the more that they have time to do their own research. You know, these are three incredibly safe, incredibly efficacious vaccines. I think confidence only grows. I am not concerned that we are going to be hindered in our ability to get to where we need to go. I do think we have to work hard. And part of that is getting the message out. There'll be more on that coming. Part of that is working closely with our community-based groups and really creating opportunities for people to have conversations to get questions answered. I think we have to work hard, but I'm 100% confident that we will get there. Yep, yes, sir. Taking that caveat that you said about predicting how many people fall into these categories, um, do you have any idea how, you know, what this expansion means for how many people are now eligible? You know, I really don't because we don't have great data of how many people have two or more of those conditions. So I, I wouldn't even venture to, to put a number to it. Yes, ma'am. I know you said it depends on supply, but are we months out from, say, creating a drive-through vaccine with National Guard uh, event like that? Mm. Oh, no. No, no, that happened this past weekend. There were drive-through vaccine events with the National Guard this weekend, absolutely. No question. Um, I think you know, what, the, what, what Operation Warp Speed and the, and the White House have projected is sometime in the middle of May, they think um, supply and demand will, will meet head-to-head, -head, meaning that they, they phrase that there'll be enough vaccine for everyone. Uh, but make no mistake, with the vaccine that we get, we've um, held a number of different types of events from very small community events at a church or a community center to a senior living facility to even very, very large drive through events like the one at the Shrine on Airline, um, formerly Zephyr Field, which is a high, high efficiency, high throughput drive through. Um, and we know down the road we're going to need all of those. You know, we'll need the big events, we'll need the small events, and we'll continue to need our vaccine providers like clinics and pharmacies, hospitals. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Also, I as well, feel free to both answer. Um, I mean, clearly this is news in itself, in its own right, by far. But what, it, what do you say to the level of symbolism, if there is one, that one year to the day, here we are? Yeah, that's... That's not lost at all, and I think um, these have been 12 really challenging months, you know, and, and, and we've lost a lot, we've suffered and sacrificed a lot, um, but, you know, I think we will come out of this stronger. As I said in the beginning, I truly believe there are better days ahead, and to have these three vaccines available right now is an absolute gift. And we're going to use that to the maximum potential. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Um, do you know how many mm -hmm. I don't have an estimate for the for the prisoner question yet. Total uh, wasted to date out of roughly 1.2 million doses that have been administered is uh, 1,483. Uh, we did have a couple. Um, a couple instances of waste that were tied to the storm a few weeks ago um, and people couldn't get on the roads, there was some power outages, those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, 1,483 is the number we're at right now. And I do want to let people know, I think, this, I think there might be some misconfusion out there. The, the vaccine providers have gotten very good at not wasting doses at the end of the day, for example. So, you know, if, if certain number of doses are taken out to prepare for an event, they're pretty good at taking out only the number that they can get through and if there's a few numbers left over, that's when it's completely acceptable to go outside of the eligibility range to make sure that the doses don't get wasted. And from that regards, it's been, it's been really effective. Thank you. Um, in closing, uh, just want to do, talk a little bit about that anniversary that you just asked about. Um, so yesterday, uh, and I like Dr. Cantor encourage you to go out and just take a look, uh, at those flags and remember that each flag represents one person from the state of Louisiana who died since March the 14th of last year. Um, and we planted 9,758 of them yesterday in the front lawn of the Capitol. 
Each of those is one of our brothers and sisters from here in our state. It includes one for April Dunn, who was the first employee of the governor's office who died, and she died on March the 28th of last year. And I was able to uh, go out with her mother yesterday, Miss Jeanette Dunn, and her grandmother as well. Um, and we were able to have a moment of reflection and prayer as we planted the first flag uh, to represent April. And we were joined by all of the cabinet secretaries, uh, many of whom also have lost staff members, employees to the virus. And so every one of those flags represents an empty seat in somebody's home somewhere. And also an empty place in many people's hearts. Today, we will plant 11 more. This Sunday will mark the one year anniversary since the first confirmed COVID-19 death. Uh, and as a result of that, I have issued a proclamation declaring Sunday to be a day of prayer and remembrance in Louisiana for those that we've lost. And I do encourage everyone to join me in praying uh, for the family and friends of those that we mourn uh, and who need our support now more than ever. And I want to make sure that we work together to prevent more deaths by continuing to do everything that is necessary to slow the transmission while we speed the vaccination. That's how we get out of this, and that's how we get out of it with the least amount of people having to go to the hospital and the least amount of people who will die. So it's important that we wear our masks, that we social distance, that we wash our hands, stay home when we're sick, and get the vaccine when it is your turn. I'm going to take some questions, but I, I did want to address a couple of things that you all raised because I want to make sure there's no confusion. When you ask whether a vaccine doesn't get used if an appointment isn't made or kept, that vaccine will be used. It's not going to be wasted. We don't waste vaccine because someone doesn't make an appointment or because an appointment doesn't get made. Uh, the challenge for us is we want to use that, that dose as soon as we possibly can. And so if an appointment isn't kept, then perhaps there's a delay in, in putting that dose into somebody else's arm. Um, and, and so that's really important uh, to us. But it is not wasted. I, I don't want anybody to, to and, and that's not what you said, but I want, I, don't want to make, I want to make absolutely sure people understand that we are not wasting doses out there when people don't show up or people don't make an appointment. We have wait lists uh, at our providers for that reason, to make sure that if they do have a dose that they need to inject into an arm that day, they have the opportunity uh, to do that. And then I want to reinforce uh, the answer that Dr. Cantor gave to Melinda. It is absolutely impossible with any precision to estimate the number of people who've been made eligible for that vaccine at this point, because you don't know how many of those people are in multiple groups and may have already availed themselves. They could be uh, in this group that we announced today. Let's say they're 40 years old and they've got hypertension, but if they're a school teacher, they already got vaccinated. Um, you know, and, and so it's just, it's just impossible to know with any precision, and that's why there's always some guesswork as to how uh, many people are in a group when you make them eligible for the vaccine. And then you're also guessing at how long the, the, uh, it will be before you're going to expand again uh, because, because you don't know how many people it is. And you also don't know the uptake, although we're encouraged that here and around the country it appears that hesitancy is diminishing, and it should. These vaccines, all three of them, are safe and effective. Uh, he gave you the numbers a while ago of the people that have at least started and those who've who finished, almost 10% uh, of, of the people of our state have finished uh, with their vaccination uh, at this point. And you all aren't reporting on any really serious side effects because to speak of, there haven't been any. 
less than a handful of individuals have had to spend one night in the hospital uh, because of a reaction. Uh, and so these are safe, they are effective. This is how we're gonna get uh, through uh, this pandemic. And, and so really asking people to focus on that. Make sure they're getting their information from reliable sources as well. I'll take a few questions. Um, I think my White House call starts at one. And, and so I will be leaving this room in just a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. A um, number of doses administered mm -hmm. per capita to among sort of the lower ranks of, mm -hmm. of states at this point. And we're now more than two weeks removed from the winter weather, yeah. which I know disrupted some supply shipments. But can you talk about um, what seems to be taking so long in terms of getting vaccines in arms and why we've, we've dropped those? Yeah. On that list? Well, I, I will tell you that. that uh, based on our experience, we know where we were when the winter weather happened and that we weren't able to get doses here and then, and then or to schedule events, people weren't able to keep their appointments. And so that's when it fell off. Um, and it, it's in, all these counts are cumulative. And so it's gonna take us some time to get back. Uh, I will tell you that um, our team is working extremely hard with all of our partners, including all of the enrolled providers uh, to really expand the hours uh, that we're administering uh, vaccine and, and the number of events and so forth in order to get caught up. I expect that what you're gonna see over the next week or 10 days is, is a huge step forward in, in getting uh, caught up again. Uh, and I think if you look at those CDC rankings and, 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 and I may be wrong in what I'm about to say because I haven't done it in the last couple of days, you will see that the states most severely impacted by the winter weather are those who slip the most in the rankings and have yet to, to make that up. Um, and we, we certainly don't use that as an excuse. It is a fact. Um, but we are working really, really hard to get back uh, and, and, and make sure that these vaccine doses are getting put into people's arms just as quickly as possible. Um, and so I expect that what you're going to see over the next week, 10 days, something like that, is, is tremendous improvement in, in the efficiency of the utilization of the vaccine doses. Yes, ma'am. Uh, switching gears a little bit, I know on Friday, uh, you're well aware of the Title IX investigation at LSU, mm -hmm. and there were some students that were protesting yesterday saying that the disciplinary actions that were taken weren't enough. And I know you talk to LSU heads often, so in your perspective, was the two employees that were suspended, was that enough of a disciplinary action yeah, yeah, look, I'm, I'm not going to second guess. I, I believe that the individuals who actually completed the study um, were able to make some recommendations uh, to the LSU board and president as to what uh, discipline they thought might be appropriate under the circumstances. It's my understanding the president adopted that, um, and, and I'm not going to, to second guess it. Uh, I will tell you that I was obviously very, very troubled by that report. I did have an opportunity over the weekend to read it in its entirety. Um, and, and what I'm about to say is true, not just for LSU, but it's, it's true for any institution of higher education in Louisiana. Uh, it is imperative that young people know and that their parents know that when they attend a university or a college here in Louisiana, they are gonna be safe and we're gonna do everything we can, humanly possible, to make sure that that happens. And we're gonna have all of the systems in place, all of the right policies, we're gonna have the right people, we're gonna have enough people, we're gonna devote enough resources to this, that we're not gonna have the confusion and the ineffective um, organizational uh, leadership that we've had in the past that were highlighted uh, in that report. And, and so, very troubled by it, I'm very, however, gratified by the fact that LSU made the report fully uh, available to the public within a few days of getting it. They've already committed to um, adopting all 18 recommendations and taking action on those. Um, so, so, look, it, it's a challenging uh, situation, uh, but I will tell you that, that I was mortified when I read the report. And it, it, it really made me sick at, at the stomach, to be honest with you. And, and, uh, and 
I am determined that, that we're going to improve not only at LSU, but make sure that that isn't happening anywhere else. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, this isn't the, f the first time we've done this. So right now, if you're age 55 to 64, uh, you've been eligible uh, for a while for the vaccine if you have one or more of these health conditions. Uh, and that process has worked well. Um, and, and so we're going to continue it. If you don't go with self-attestation, then you're going to require all of these individuals to go to a primary care physician or, or some, to some other medical provider and get a report and then come back and get in line and and that would be terribly inefficient you're putting another barrier uh, between individuals uh, and, and the vaccine and we're trying to do this in a way that eliminates as many barriers as possible um, and and i certainly haven't inventoried the approach being taken by all 50 states it is my understanding that all or practically all uh, when they go to health conditions, they're doing it on this basis because anything else uh, would just create tremendous inefficiency. It would slow the process down and it would put another barrier, uh, especially between the underserved uh, population uh, and the vaccine. And we're not going to do that in Louisiana. But, but we want Louisianans to be good neighbors. And that means you don't get the vaccine before you're eligible for it. And, and certainly that's, that's something that, that uh, we, we're going to continue to stress. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, well look, we, we didn't reinvent the wheel. Uh, these comorbid health conditions um, have been uh, listed by the CDC and emphasized for a long time. Um, and virtually since the start of the pandemic, it became immediately clear there was a segment of the population that was much more predisposed to a poor outcome uh, should they contract the virus than others. And that's because they had these comorbid health conditions that made them more vulnerable. And, and that list has expanded over time as, as the doctors and scientists and so forth have learned more about the virus and the disease and its impacts on people and, and, and so forth. Uh, but we just took those those conditions directly from the CDC. We didn't substitute our own opinion for for any of them. Um, and and I think that being faithful uh, to the guidance that's coming out of the CDC is very important if you're going to have credibility uh, with the people that you're serving uh, when you make decisions. And so, to the maximum extent possible, we've tried to do that. Um, and and this is no exception. So our next press conference will be a week from Thursday, again, unless we have reason to call you back earlier. Um, I do thank you again for continuing to cover this uh, situation and as we approach the anniversary mark. And I want to close out by again uh, asking people this Sunday um, to, on, on March the 14th, uh, to observe a day of prayer and remembrance for all of those whose lives have been lost to COVID-19. And we have a lot of individuals out there who, who life, life may not have been taken by this disease, but their health remains severely compromised and they are not back uh, to normal. And so we need to, to remember them as well. And then let's make sure that we're being thankful at the same time. You know, we're, we're told to make sure that we rejoice always, pray unceasingly and give thanks in all things. And we can be thankful for the vaccines. We can be thankful for our health care workers. We can be thankful for a lot of things that are uh, coming to bear right now on the anniversary of the start of this pandemic. So let's, let's do that uh, together. Let's get through this as best we can, as soon as we can. That happens by people wearing their masks, distancing, washing their hands, staying home when they're sick, and getting vaccinated uh, when they're able. So thank all of you.